In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Lord, and the Lord, and continue in chapter 5. We stopped last time, I think, at the different interpretations of the verses till verse 5. And we're on page 3 on the handout. So, <clears throat> let's uh, recap. I have come to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice in verse 1. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And we say this is the church, uh, my garden. That's the church reminding us of the Garden of Eden. My sister and my spouse. Um, we use it we use the same term with Saint Mary and it shows that this book is not about carnal love but it's about spiritual love. That's why he says my sister and my spouse and there is no way according to the law um, that that somebody can have a, a marital relationship with his sister and, and later on with, with other relatives as well in the law came. I've gathered my mirror with my spice and we said this is um, my mirror was my spice was spent quite a bit of time on it last time because the mirror and the spice remind us of immediately the Lord. The burial of the Lord is he was buried with mirror and spice in St. John chapter 19, about um, about um, hundred pounds of, of them. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey, which is uh, every every crucifixion will lead will lead to uh, will lead to honey, will lead to the resurrection. And I have drunk my wine with my milk, that is the church, and the continuous work of the church to keep us nourished with the communion. As we said, the whole the whole essence of the way we look at this book is not as a as a carnal love, but the love of God to me. And the love of God to me is given by communion. We're in the first four verses of chapter five, just uh, revising what we did last time. Um so it sets the stage, the first, the, first, the first verse, I have come to my church, my sister, my spouse, I have gathered my cross, and I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey, I have drunk my wine with my milk, all of the, all of the gifts that the church gives us, because the church now is no longer a tabernacle, it's no longer a building, but it's, it's God himself, it's the body of Christ. So we see the body of Christ. I am attached to the body of Christ by one thing. The, the one thing that attaches me to the body of Christ is the communion. And attachment to the body of Christ gives me two things. It gives me tribulations and honey. Tribulations and sweetness. Which is, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I'm in, in the first verse in the chapter 5. And I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. So I cannot, I cannot eat the honey unless I'm gathering also the myrrh with the spice. And this is what the beautiful thing, thing about Lent. We feel the resurrection more, more because of the length of Good Friday and the length of Bright Saturday. And then we were very ready to receive the resurrection. I mean, we're all in a very, very spiritual condition. If you don't have a handout, we'll, uh, it's from last time. But we're revising what we did last time in order to continue. Eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Then we come into these different interpretations of, of verses from 3 to 5. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh, on the hands of the block. 
What does this mean? It means that the, he's trying to enter my heart. He put his hand on the lock. Although I gave an excuse that I'm already in bed. And we see here the sleep condition. She, sleep, she slept for a little while and she missed out on her lover. And that's a very um, important warning for myself um, that not to put our spirit to sleep, but to put our body to sleep. Let's go to the bottom of page three in the handout. As St. Gregory of Nisa is advising us to put our body to sleep. And this is how we can open the door quickly. Can we put the phone to sleep? <laughs> hey, Caroline, can you read for us the last part of the page, Gregory of Nisa? Once all the senses have been put to sleep and are gripped by an action, the heart's action is clear. Reason looks above while it remains undisturbed and free from the senses movement. If a person pays attention to the senses and is drawn by pleasure in the body, he will live his life without tasting the divine joy, since the good can be overshadowed by what is inferior. For those who desire God, a good not shadowed over by anything awaits them. They realize that what enters the senses must be avoided. Therefore, when the soul enjoys only the contemplation of being, it will not arise for those things char affect sensual pleasure. It puts to rest all bodily movement, and by naked, pure insight, the soul will see God in divine watchfulness. May we be made worthy through the sleep of which the song has spoken to keep our soul vigilant. So here, St. Gregory of Nisa, who has done quite a commentary on this, that he's asking us to put our senses to sleep. St. Cyril, which we read last time, he's looking at the sleep as the sleep of the Lord, and my heart is awake as his resurrection. So there is different, different ways of contemplation on it. First one, St. Cyril says that I sleep, but my heart is awake. This is like he's putting his body to sleep. He is the first one of those who have fallen asleep, and, and we we'll be, we'll benefit from this. We we'll benefit from this the hope that if our earthly tent is demolished, so if your life is really difficult, but your heart is awake, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then you will enjoy what an eye has not seen and ear has not heard. And what God has prepared for you. Because your life was asleep. Which means your life was persecuted. And you accepted this. So we need to sleep with the Lord. We need to, when our death be called, we have fallen asleep. Because, because we are sleeping, we are, as St. Gregory tells us, we need to sleep to this life, not to be completely awake in this life, and then when we go to the liturgy, we'll sleep. I'm not saying here, I mean, sarcastically, and, and, or, or like um, rendering a judgment, but, but my, the sleep could be, could be in different ways. That's, that's, if, my, if my mind is, is not sober and thinking of something else, then I'm asleep. That's why in the middle of the liturgy, it says, you who are seated, stand. It doesn't mean, people are already standing. I keep explaining this. Why is saying you who are seated stand? So anybody who's sitting stand up? No. You who are not resurrected, resurrect. This is actually the, 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 the Coptic translation of this or the Greek meaning of it. Those who are not resurrected, resurrect. So if you're coming to the liturgy with your mind is still thinking of the outside or what you're going to do after or you're texting or when is it going to this to be over or whatever makes you pass time so that this is over with, the church says, please wake up from what you're doing. And then on to the east look. And then let us attend. Let us attend and we're going to sing. It doesn't say let us sing. The deacon says let us attend. Which means let's hear the angels leading us in this song. The cherubim worship you and the seraphim glorify you. And proclaiming and saying holy, holy, holy. So uh, it pays off. <laughs> it keeps repeating. This chapter, this book more and more reveals itself. How it is about the liturgy. That there is nothing worth actually attending compared to the liturgy. Okay, so two ways of looking at it. We need to put ourselves to sleep in terms of our physical lust so that our heart be awake. This is Gregory of Nisa. This is in, in page three. Uh, above it, a little in page three, 
if we read above it in page three, let's look at Cyril of Alexandria. For those who were here last time, I'm repeating it a little bit so everybody will be on the same same page. Uh, who can read? I think uh, Billy can read for us. Cyril of Alexandria, I sleep. I sleep, he says, on the cross, insofar as he suffers death on behalf of humanity. But his heart remains awake because, as God, he plunders Hades. Bright Saturday. This is Good Friday and bright, and, and bright Saturday. He plunders Hades, means he goes to Hades, and we live with him that all of these who were captured, he plunders, means he defiles Hades, means like he spoils Hades. Hades that was trapped for the saints that the devil takes because Christ hasn't come. Now he goes and like opens and takes this, and, and Hades is no longer a place that can have authority over us. So, verse 3 and 4 and 5 is her, our life when we're a little bit having an excuse or lack of priority, like her mind is awake, she means, well, at just one time she postponed it. That's why do not, do not postpone ever any feeling that you want to confess or you want to, 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 to repent. Uh, even if a woman is not available, for example, do on this, do on this, sit with the Lord and, 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 and do it li- loudly. I do this, I fall on this, and so on. So, <clears throat> I have taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? I have washed my feet, how can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for them. So this seems that she's just snoozed them. She's not falling completely in sin. As soon as he put his hand, her heart moved. These excuses are out of the way. That is what the, the Bible tells us. Micah 7, 8. Write this down. Micah 7, 8. Do not mock me, my enemy. For if I fall, I will stand up again. And the light of the Lord will shine upon me. So when the devil traps you in some sin, even repeatedly, answer him every time you fall. Do not mock me, my enemy. For if I fall, I will stand up again. This is the attitude. That, that's why, that's why um, she's able to sleep and the heart is awake. So we see dogma here. We see the sacraments because our church doesn't have departments. It doesn't have the liturgical and then history and, and then Bible study. It is all because it's all guided by one thing, the work of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments through the church, through the body of Christ, and through it we understand the whole, the whole book and enjoy it and look at it through the, the, the liturgical life. So to summarize quickly, I sleep but my heart is awake is the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And it is also, if I apply it to myself, I want to put my lust to sleep so that my heart can be awake. Verse 3, that... Any excuses can be quickly overcome. As soon as I hear his hand on the latch, I go and open, which is verse 5. I arose. I arose is a key word here. Resurrection. When we do the procession, he arose. This word means for us in the New Testament a completely different dimension than the Old Testament, which makes us think this could be talking to, uh, to us the transfer from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, people are with God, but they can't reach him. Then who opens the door and enters or tries to enter? This is the entrance into the New Testament. So the Lord did this entrance. From now on, I can, I can rise. And my hands dripped with myrrh. We said this last time, dripped with myrrh that I'm crucified with Christ. So I, I no longer, I live, but Christ lives in me. I, I am crucified with Christ, that I, I, no long, I no longer live, but Christ lives with me in Galatians. So if Christ has been, um, his life was myrrh, and at the end he was wrapped with myrrh, then myself also I have, I have to have my life dripping with myrrh. As we said last time, I am black and beautiful, which means that and the sun has tanned me, that means that I went through a lot of tribulations and that made me more beautiful. So you're, you're covered with myrrh. And that happens also only to the people who are self-denying themselves, especially in, in, in the service, because me specifically, when the service becomes visible 
I have inside to, to put myself down in order that I get some reward because otherwise there wouldn't. So the more visible, the more we have to do the hidden work, which is the mirror. My fingers with liquid mirror, which means that it reaches all of myself, even it's, 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 it's my fingers. It's not just a small touch, but I'm, I'm dipped in it on the hands of the lock. So I, I want, by the work of the cross, to open, to remove any barrier between me and Christ. I want to open for Christ my heart. I want to really, in, in the tribulations, the first one that I want to open my heart for is, is our Lord. In fact, let's go to the book of Psalms. It's this, I, I hope I can find it quickly, but it's, the, it's Psalm 141. So help me find it uh, in the 12th hour. If you want to open it in the Akbar, that's fine. I'll try to see if it's here, easily to find, maybe 142. Yes, 142, so page 332. Let's go to page 332 together. And I want someone to pray for us this psalm. <coughs> Irene, would you like to pray for us? I cry. I cry out to the Lord with my voice, with my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. Okay, so it's all in front of who I pour out my complaint before him. Because when I pour it out on people, that's good venting, but they don't help. They're limited. They're limited. So this is when, when things are like making my chest tight and I'm very tired, the best one to pour things to, even if it's silent prayer, is the Lord. I, will, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. <coughs> when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. This is, this is in your jobs, in your work, sometimes in the service itself, you find your spirit is overwhelmed within you. There's a, there's a snare that's set for you. And secretly, you, you don't know where to put your foot. You don't know what to do with some people. No matter what you do, it will not reach anywhere with them. So you feel you're overwhelmed. You feel that you're not heard. You feel that you, you can't get anywhere. It's a feeling that Christ went through day in and day out. Let's continue. Okay. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. My feet have failed me. No one cares for my soul. Amazing. So there's no one except him. No one cares for my soul. I looked everywhere. There's a snare. I'm overwhelmed. I, I don't know really what, know what to do. So what do I do? I cried. I cried out to you, O Lord, and said, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, but I am brought very low. Well. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name, the right you shall surround me, for you shall be like that uh, downstream city. So the last half of verse 7 is success. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. So you see, all of this is somebody... Me, you are my refuge, you're my portion, attend to me, I'm brought very low, and my persecutors, I, I'm hurt over and over and over, they are stronger than I. Whenever I try to have logic, they always have this, our tongue is with us, nobody can argue against us, like we're so, we're so strong in our arguments, we can shut anybody up. We, we can sometimes allow to fall in the hand of, of people of this sort. So before you sleep, if you can pray the psalm, it's in the 12th hour, it's Psalm 141 in the 12th hour. Um, in order that the whole day, if you find that you're overwhelmed, you don't know what to do, and there's tomorrow you're going to see more of this person. So you, you, you just say, God, you, you hear me. Hear me because I know that you will deal bountifully with you. I hope it's here that you get your fairness. Sometimes um, it, it might be a heavier and heavier result in the kingdom of heaven. So the love of the Song of Solomon is, is telling us that um, some people will bruise us and will, help, will, will, will hurt us. So let's go to verse 6, back again to 357, into the chapter. I know here, um, 
we read some part on page four in the handout. The third part is comment on verse five and verse and Saint Ambrose, Saint Gregory the Great, Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Saint Saint Bede is all of that me suffering with Christ, and I will get this lesson. We read uh, this last time, and um, it's all uploaded to the uh, church website. So let's continue. He had gone. I opened for my beloved, but my lover had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So sometimes as we pray the Psalm 142, the, the answer of the Lord is delayed. And this is what, what is saying that she suffered is that the answer of the Lord is delayed. So it's, it's more, more anxiety. Like I wish I opened when he tried to, when, when he knocked. The watchman who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am love sick. That is the best feeling to have, to be love sick to the Lord. And if you can't, if you don't come to church, you just can't handle the day anymore. So let's read together what St. Gregory of Nyssa says. The bride says, I sought him, but found him not. How can the bridegroom be found when he does not reveal anything of himself? He has no color, form, quality on page five. Quality, quantity, place, appearance, evidence, comparison or resemblance. Rather, everything we can discover always transcends our comprehension and completely escapes our search. Transcends means higher than, we can't, God is transcendent means that he's incapable of the mind to comprehend him. So you pray and you feel there is no answer. That doesn't mean there is no answer. And the devils use this in the same thing against you, the watchmen. Now in this case, the watchmen are not the watchmen that we studied earlier that guided him directly to him. When they found me, they beat me up. So they, they tried to use this opportunity they found me once without my beloved. I'm alone without him. So let's gather against him. Let's let's get her this time. Get the soul this time. Took my veil off of me. That's that's made me fall in sin. Made me naked. Whom did we see that was taken was taken naked? We see Joseph when he went to check on his brothers that lied to their dad in Genesis 37. Go and check on them and shake him. He went to Shechem, the, the person who was there told him he's not, they are not here, they went to Dosan. They saw him from a distance, here is the dreamer. And then they, they beat him up and they wanted to kill him. And Reuben interceded for him. They put him in a well and they conspired to sell him. As we're saying this, the father sends the son Joseph. Joseph, here, here I am my father, go and check on your brethren. Just as it's being said, just think of Christ. He goes and checks on his brethren. His brethren is supposed to receive him to his own. He came, but his own did not receive him in St. John chapter 1. In fact, as the, as the, the parable of the, of the evil vine dressers, when they see the air coming from a distance, he sends servants and they curse. The other one, they beat him up. And then he said, I said, my son, oh, here is the air coming. H-E-I-R. And then they beat him up. Uh, sorry, they kill him. They kill him. So... So exactly as they did with Christ. So Joseph coming to check on the Pharisees, let's me give them the good news. No, I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill him and they, kill, they killed him. So there's nowhere to go. The fact that there is nowhere to go is something that Christ feels very, 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 very much. You are so close to God when, you're, when you feel like this Psalm 142. I, I, my refuge, I, I don't know where to go. They set a snare for me. And then I pray here and then I get beaten more. So. Don't worry, because you love sick to God, God will not leave you. And he knows exactly what happens, because it happened with Joseph, it happened with Moses, it happened with him, 
once himself it happened with Elijah it happened with all of those who wanted really to stand up for the right thing therefore the bride says I have sought him by my soul's capacities of reflection and understanding so if you pray and you don't feel your focus it's no problem continue praying it is not easy to pray it's not easy to feel God in the prayer it's not your fault He's, as he says, he has no color, he has no form, he has no quality, he has no quantity, place, appearance, evidence, comparison, or resemblance. But when we contemplate on the cross and play this movie of the cross, and that's why watching, watching too much worldly things will make your, your, your mind, the eye of the mind, very dim. You will not be able to, when you close your eyes, to see something spiritual, because most of our input is carnal. Even if it's not sinful, it means sinful. He completely transcended them and he escaped my mind when it drew to him. So St. Gregory of Nyssa says it's, it's normal. It's normal that you pray and you don't feel that you, you don't feel God. It's a gift from God and he will give it to you and he will give you the blessing. If you pray and you don't feel it but you continue praying, that's a blessing. God will reward you for that prayer. Not for, don't, don't think that it will not be rewarded because you couldn't focus. Because it's, it's a war. The devil has a war against you. Because if you, if you start tasting the prayer, the, the devil will, will lose. So no matter what, I go and find him. I get beaten when I find him. Just please, when you find him, let him know I'm lovesick. And Christ answers us in the New Testament. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out in St. John chapter 6. And last week was the prodigal son. And he came back lovesick. And the father accepted him to the same level that he was. What is your beloved more than another beloved or fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you charge us? Why is he different? Why, why, he's asking, why, why do you look for him that? Why do you look for him that more, that that strongly? I mean, let him, he went, he went. It, 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 you don't have to tire yourself. The the presence of Christ in our life is not, is not to respond to our needs and not to respond to our requests. The presence of Christ in our life because we're Christian. Forget your last name. Your last name is, is Christ now. Your, your, your identity is that you became a son of God or a daughter of God. So we don't look for God because we, want, we, need, we need him, but we look for him because there is no other place where we are existing. Our existence has no meaning. For the Christian, your existence has no meaning if you are not with Christ. You're not considered living. So the answer here is not, I'm not trying to like look for him because I want something from him. I'm trying to look for him because without him, I don't exist. In him, in Acts, it tells us in him, we exist and we have our existence and we, we move, we act. So we love God because outside of God, we don't exist. Outside of God, we do not exist. And that's really a gift because you're very, very gifted that you have only one way of one way of living, the Christian way. Any other way, consider yourself you're not alive. Myself, of course, included. So enjoy, enjoy your identity. So the question here is the devil said, what is your beloved more than another beloved? Or fairest I won't go. Why is God so important for you? Let it go. Just have a double life. Enjoy yourself and do some sins here and there. It's okay. God is merciful. What is your beloved more than another beloved that you charge us, that you so charge us? Like, I need to find them. I need to find them. I need to go to somebody who can find him for me. And that's a church. That is really the communion. And he's not far from us at all. In fact, any communion puts him right inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, the Lord himself lives in us. Any questions so far? So this chapter five is, a, is, a, is mind boggling because it gathers all of the Old and the New Testament in it. My garden, my sister, my spouse. Christ is with myrrh and spices and he's also honey and honeycomb. He also gives me wine and milk, nurturing and eternal life. He gives me life to live here and, and there as well. I want to be dripped with myrrh and my fingers was liquid mirror when I go and open the, the door for him. Even if it's, I want to be ready. I want to be carrying my cross. In St. Luke chapter 14, if anybody wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself. That's your mirror. You're going to drink mirror when you deny yourself because it's completely counterhuman. 
when you say sorry and you did not make a mistake, that is the epitome of denying yourself. And that's mer, it's bitter. It's really, really tough because we always seek fairness. But don't seek fairness because, because it's important for the children of God to be dripped in mer as he was dripped in mer. Then there's going to be heavier, heavier reward for you. And, and, and God, God doesn't forget it. Okay, I go. Why is the reaction of the watchman different than before? Why one time? The delay. The delay. It could be meeting another group of watchmen than the first one. So this, in, in the first one, is always she's always with him. So the watchmen will be the ones that help him help her to be with him. The delay tells us you might run into mm -hmm. other watchmen that would not guide you for him. If you think that he was protecting her in the beginning. She's with him, so the watchman always... Cannot approach her. But also we're guiding her. The type of watchman is different. Because here, definitely these watchmen are not trying to let her... Oh, let, let's, let me point you to where, where he is. So there could be two types of watchmen, two types of servants, two types of guides. One that seeks their own glory and one that seeks the glory of Christ. One that seeks in order to capture her to himself and one that seeks that would send her to Christ. So it's telling us not every watchman is a watchman. You can run into a watchman that does not lead you to Christ. So be careful. And that's actually a metaphor for the delay. When you delay, the watchman's also my conscience. So my conscience, if it's pure, pure with the Lord, all will lead me to him. If I delay, maybe my conscience now wounds me, try to get accustomed to sinning, cuts corners, and so on. So any, any person who's supposed to guide me or any, any feeling that's supposed to guide me, when I snooze away from God, it can switch. That's why we need always to be in the presence of Christ, always having communion, always not, not entertaining sins. Can I ask you something? So you said covered in myrrh. As children of God, we're covered in myrrh, as he was. God created us to also live our life and have fun and enjoy our lives. Why is it that we're covered in life? Why is it that we have to suffer? In another? The suffering here is suffering for liberation, not suffering for torture. When a Christian person suffers for Christ, it gives peace. It doesn't give hurt. This is what St. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, not imitate me, period. And Christ says in Luke 14, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself carry his cross and follow me. So the, the, it doesn't mean it's a life of torture, but if it is a life of difficulty, the Christian person is more prepared to tolerate it than any other person. So we have to be ready for the tribulation. It doesn't come great. And God gives every person a portion. And you find some people's life harder than others. The problem happens when, when I run away from tribulation. Just everybody. Because, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you answered your, your answer. Thank you very much. I like this <laughs> self answer. It's very good. It doesn't mean we don't have fun. It doesn't mean that we don't go to movies. It doesn't. It's every person. This is not a general. We're not like uh, other religions do this and don't do this in the sense of like. Uh, no, it's the Holy Spirit guides us, and it guides us to the point that the path is very clear. We don't have to find it. It's very very clear. It has been thread. It's the church. All of the saints went through it, all of the monks went through it, all of the fathers went through it. It's the prayer with the Psalms, it's the Bible, it is taking communion. There's nothing else to try. But it sounds the same, but the depth of it is, un is unlimited with every person. You find, you find the person just doesn't have enough of the prayers, doesn't have enough of the Bible, doesn't have enough of, even if didn't, as a monk secluded, doesn't have communion every week but he's with Christ and then he comes and, and gets filled with God. So God has no limit on how much he can get you into loving him. But we have to, we have to, you know, go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, I understand no, no, what you're no, trying no. to say, but my question is, when you're saying that, <clears throat> you're saying covered, you know, like some people, it's Shehadet from us. He might live a life of sin. And one day he's in church and Muslims come in, they kill him, and all of a sudden he's a, he's a martyr and he goes to heaven. That's what you hear. Mm. How is that compared to a monk who lived his entire life in a cave, praying and fasting oh, night and day? Okay, 
first of all, this condition <coughs> that is, we, we don't know the end of the person. Might not make it to the kingdom of heaven. Might that death came to him? Died. What is the difference between dying like this and dying in an accident? If he's in the liturgy and not repenting and is going to sin again and he dies, basically he so missed his life. Again. No, no, no. We sh we're not. We cannot. On our surface, we call them martyrs, or we call them that they died for the Lord because we can't judge what their lifestyle was. But the one who can judge this, you, you can't either. You didn't know what his life. Maybe he repented that day, and God, like Saint Isa, she repented, and the same day so her soul was taken. So we can't tell. But if somebody is living a life of sin, it happens to be in a liturgy where he, where he dies, no, he will not go to the kingdom of heaven. However, I'm not the judge. God can see everything and for some reason gets him in. He knows maybe he's struggling. Like, for example, one monk was a drunk monk. He's in, in the, in the, one of St. Paisius <clears throat> tells the story about uh, one of the monks that he was born. His parents got him to be quiet by giving him wine. So he grew up as an addict and became a monk. So he started his monasticism with, with, with 20 uh, wine cups and he ended with two. So to the eye, this person is always drinking wine as a monk, but nobody knows what he started with and what he ended. And so he, some places told the monks about this because they, they felt that the monastery became cleaner when this monk died. <laughs> so this is qu questions like this. No one would know at all. So the person was living in sin, but he, maybe he's struggling very hard. Maybe he's fighting. So in other words, God judges everybody by the way he knows. No, no. Their own hearts. No, no one knows at all. No one knows at all. He knows who's the sinner and who's the repentant. He knows who's a hypocrite and who's the one who's struggling. He knows. But we have to be always ready for sudden death as well. This, if, if I'm sinful and I die in a liturgy, that doesn't make me a martyr. Okay, any other question? Any comment? <clears throat> This is up for discussion, by the way. <laughs> be scared from me. No, not scared before with Christ. Okay. Christ. But so when you take the communion, is not that wiping clean? When I take, it's not a portion. No, I, no, no, I don't mean <laughs> I'm not, be, it, no. I'm not being sarcastic I mean, either. I have to be also ready for it. Again, it's a, it's a, when the person enters, he might be very, very repentant. I will not go back to what I did. I really, God can receive this repentance as the repentance. He sees the heart. He sees the contrition. He sees how the person is really, is really re repentant for what he's doing. And then you walk back out of the church, back into real life, and you're back to lying or cheating or whatever it we is. We struggle. We struggle. It, uh, the beauty is to think about Christianity. It's full of hope. Like God will find a way. We're not guaranteed heaven, but we'll, God will try to find any way to get us there. But if we resist, we have free will. So thank God that he's on our side. He will always be on our side. He will not resist us. God resists the proud though, because the proud has a mindset that he is above God. Even if it doesn't say this, but it's, he's above the commandment. He's above humility. He's, we, we, it sounds very, very big, but pride is really defiant in front of God. And then it becomes a target to, to the watchman, this type of watchman, the devil. Is the proud person is, is very, very easy for the devils to tempt him with, with everything. The humble is, is exactly the opposite. Actually, this will put us very well. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chief among 10,000. Did I answer your question? Okay. Anybody wants any comment? So, in, enjoy God. Enjoy God and, and again, I just want to give you comfort. Anybody who's going through difficulty, you're closer, you're very, very close to God because by definition, by definition, if life is difficult, God is closer to us than it's easy. He wants us to go through this, uh, these tribulations. It purifies us. It makes us always under check. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. You see now, of course, over and over the detailed descriptions. It's not just God is beautiful and that's it. The, the, this book shows us the poetry of God, the poetry of the Holy Spirit, that how God is 
also appreciates beauty in the way he writes the Bible. So <clears throat> let's go to the commentary. There are some here and on these descriptions. I like the, the um, St. Gregory of Nice says the analogy from the visible to the invisible. Who can read it for us? Taylor, can you read for us, please? please on page five, St. Gregory of Nisa. Hmm. All these elements constituting the bridegroom's duty are made known for our benefit, but not, but do not show the invisible impediments of you. Therefore, whoever looks at the visible world and understands the way for man's been Means. made manifest by the beauty of the creature can make an analogy from the visible to invisible beauty. The fountain of beauty whose emanation established all living things in existence. Similarly, whoever views the world of this new creation in the church sees in it him who is all in all. This person is then led by faith through what is finite and comprehensible to knowledge of, infinite, of the infinite. Okay. So this is um, this is the, how the humble eye sees beauty of God in the creation, which is um, unfortunately uh, doesn't happen now. And there's all sort of um, atheism that just look at the beauty of the creation and says it came by chance or it came by um, by itself or or whatever mecha whatever mechanism that brought together so many things that beautiful in the universe. And and people ascribe it to self-starting universe, multiverse, uh, bouncing. It's, there's so many theories that now how to get out from saying that God created this way. Um, it just happens. The, the, Darwinism. Besides that, there is there's also Darwinism in the in the creation of the in the beginning of the universe as well. Uh, how, how it evolved from elements. So. We're supposed to look at this and contemplate on the on the beauty of God, but unfortunately, we, uh, we fall. Or the world falls into its own um, its own beauty and worships more the creation more than the Creator. Worships science more than the one who who created science and was really giving us the mind to discover and the mind to have degrees in it and the mind to be researchers. All of this is a gift from God. In fact, all of the all of the early um, the early scientists were in in uh, in uh, church funded universities but unfortunately the devil interfered and he got it completely into his hand but we'll uh, we'll keep educating against it in the right way uh, andrew my beloved is white and ruddy this part so saint jerome let's hear what saint jerome says <coughs> My beloved is white and ruddy, white in virginity, ruddy in martyrdom. And because he is white and ruddy, therefore it is immediately added, his mouth is most sweet. Yeah, he is altogether lovely. Next one as well. MBD. The beloved is white because when he appeared in the flesh, he committed no sin, nor was found, nor was a lie found in uh, in his mouth. Okay, can we take a note here? Right, Leviticus chapter 2. That is the offering of the grain offering to attempt to eat. The grain offering and the, and the grain offering is very, very white. And we said when we did the book of Leviticus, it's a symbol of the life of Christ. And now I now get it become it become clearer and clearer that the first two sacrifices, Leviticus 1, which has been always the sacrifice, <clears throat> even before the law. The burnt offering that's Christ on the cross. Second sacrifice, the grain offering, which is symbol of Christ's life, uh, purity. And now I, I can relate very well. Remember when I keep telling you that Christ said, who can rebuke me of one sin? Who can rebuke me of one sin? And on the cross also, he overcame death. So the, the, the two things he did to, to give us a pure humanity is his life and his death. Or his death and his life. His death is represented by the, the burnt offering. That's the first offering, the most important one. And the second one, it turns out to be the green offering, which is not an animal sacrifice. It has no blood in it. And that, as the father say, that this is a symbol of Christ's life. 
And now it becomes more important when we start thinking God wants God want to give us a new humanity, the humanity that was defiled when we fell by following the devil, as we described in the tale. He has to give us a new life and a life that overcomes death as well. So it had to be two. And that's why he said, who can rebuke me of one sin? Who can rebuke me of one sin? To tell us, to prove to us loudly, and Christ will not lie, of course, <clears throat> that he did not commit any sin. He gave us a pure life. And it appears in him start, starting his ministry by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. So Leviticus 2 is the grain offering that they need to eat. <clears throat> and it, it's, it's so amazing now that I, it becomes very clear the first two offerings represent Christ's death and life to give us the humanity without any unblemished, basically. Because if Christ committed one sin, we would not be saved because, because he defiled the humanity that he took. He made, he made it fall as well. So that's why it, it's important to, to have in our faith that Christ did not commit any sin. And it's important to have these words about him um, he's white and ruddy, but very, 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 very pure. I hope we, can, we, we remember this in our prayers as we look at Christ on the cross and Christ in our life. Not just blood dripping, but how beautiful he is um, to us. Aponius, he is white. You don't want me to finish the rest of... Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, Saint please. Peter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And he is red because he has washed away our sins with his blood. He is rightly called white first, then red, because the Holy One first came into the world from blood and later departed from the, from the world through his bloody passion. Next one, Aponius. Aponius. He is white because he is the light of the world, the son of the righteous, the son of the righteousness, which enlightens everyone entering, entering the world according to St. John the Evangelist and the preaching of the prophets he is red because he would because he would walk on earth in the fleshly clothing derived mm -hmm. from the virgin mary a miracle to be offered through the angels by the right by rising to heaven as was said through the mouth of the prophet isaiah to those who asked him why is your apparel red exposition the song of songs 834 35 last one Theodoret of Sire, I don't know, I hope that's correct, yeah. or Seer. Right. His eyes like doves on pools of water. His eyes are constantly upon the source of baptism, awaiting those being saved, and on ging, and on going for the salvation of everyone. So this is when the fathers look at the description of, of Christ. Um, how he is, they can't, the Holy Spirit can't just uh, write a sentence. He gives us a detailed description of how, how God is from inside. So, if we go to verse 15, he looks at the legs. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. Let's read actually to 15 because I haven't finished. My beloved is white and ruddy, <coughs> chief among 10,000. Usually, when we say 10,000, it represents heaven, thousand, thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand was always a representation of the heavenly host. <laughs> so that's God is chief of the heavenly hosts. God is the is the heavenly hosts are all under him, <laughs> except when one cherub decided to be above him, and this is what we would add because of that cherub. His head is like the finest gold, his locks are wavy. And black as a raven, his eyes are like doves, the meekness learned from me for a meek and humble at heart. By the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. Description, description of how beautiful God is. I hope you all see him. His hands are rods of gold set with burial. His body is carved ivory, inlaid with sapphires. These are also the, the precious stones about the holy city in Revelation 21 and 20. And also uh, the description of, of Satan before the fall. These precious stones were in him. In, and when we did it in Ezekiel 28 from verse 12 to verse 17. His legs are pillars of marble. 
set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. It makes you melt, really. I will, no call, I will no longer call you slaves, but friends. This is what the Lord said to the disciples. <coughs> so let's, um, maybe I have, yeah, of course, I have two pages. So let's read and um, finish off. Taylor, can you read for us all of the commentaries, St. Ambrose and Gregory of Nice and so forth? When Jesus Christ could dare to come into church, as he died, whom he alone and none other, has all come Lebanese is Lebanon, just the old English. Yeah. Saying, Come here from Lebanon, my bride. Come here from Lebanon. Or whom, or whom else could the church have said, His throat is sweetness, and he is altogether desirable. Which is this verse we're talking about. He's altogether lively, lively and his, his mouth is sweet. And seeing that we enter, and seeing that we entered upon this discussion, from, from speaking of the shoes of the speaking of the shoes of the feet, to whom else but the word of God incarnate can those words apply? His legs are poised of marble that upon bases of gold. For Christ alone walks in the souls and makes his path in the minds of the saints, in which, as upon bases of gold and the foundations of precious stone, the heavenly word has left his footprint ineffaceably. So this is as he steps in our souls, we want him to be stable. We want to put, want him to put the gold in our soul, which is the purified um, feeling of the divinity or the the relationship with God. So mm -hmm. this is contemplation of Saint Ambrose. And we want his feet to to really step into our souls, that he always enters our hearts. Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Truth is golden, and its bases are the, are the bridegroom's legs adorning his hands and his hand head. The foundation may be interpreted as marble. We understand by the song's words that the body of glory are marble pillars, that is, those persons who support and bear the body of the church by its temporary lives and strong voice. Through them, the base of our faith is firm. The course of virtue is completed. And the entire body is raised on high by our longing for God's promise. Truth and stability by the church's body. Gold, re gold represents truth, which according to Paul is called the foundation of the fine edifice. edifice. Mm -hmm. Christ is the truth upon whom are founded the way to the church. St. Paul tells us actually in 1 Corinthians that I laid upon you a foundation that is Christ, and I will lay no other foundation but Christ. So here that the, the, the legs and the stability tells us this is the truth. I am the truth. The church, when there is any attack on the divinity of Christ or in his humanity, like for example, Arius attacked the divinity and Apollinarius attacked the, the humanity and Macedonius attacked the Holy Spirit. And then and Nestorius attacked the nature of Christ. All of this, the whole church rises. No, we have to say the truth. We have to say who Christ is. Our Savior nature is so and so. He is God. He is equal to the Father. He is existent with the Father. He is one with the Father. All of these that we cannot just continue without the right teaching. But coupled with this, the spiritual life. And that's the beauty of the church fathers. They were not, they were not scholars. In fact, other faiths, or well, other sects of Christianity call them church scholars. They're far, their attitude is so far from scholars. In fact, the, the, the school of Alexandria suffered the absence of its teachers because at the time of martyrdom, there was nobody to teach because they were all martyred. If you study the early, the early, uh, the early history of the church of Alexandria, before the persecution stopped, you find that all of the teachers in it, especially the deans of it, were, were church fathers and they ended up being martyred. Um, that's exactly a theologian is a teacher because he knows how to pray. A theologian is a praying person, and as a praying a praying person is a theologian. It's not it's not uh, an education only, but it's also attitude. Let's go to San Cyril of Alexandria. These are foundations for for whoever builds 
That is so important. That's why we are an apostolic church. We have to build on the apostles and the apostles built upon the prophet because they have now the one whom the prophet told, foretold or foreshadowed about. There's no invention here. There's no, there is no dichotomy. There is no anything, anything strange or paradoxical. It's all one line. It is very, very fluid. He asked for an answer to the word after the body. He said that marvel is set upon bases of gold. Peter and John are pillars of the church. For example, to have Christ called by a golden name as their foundation. St. Paul tells that I've seen the pillars as th that's Peter and John. And also, I went to, when he discussed in Galatians, when we discussed, uh, talked about Galatians as an example of a church that was going to deviate from the apostolic faith by introducing works of the law in the in the New Testament. Um, St. Paul is describing, I went down and I saw among the pillars, Peter, John, and James, and why is he called them pillars? These are the same three that Christ took with him in 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 the in the transfiguration, in the in the Garden of Gethsemane. So these are foundation for the faith, and and we always have this statement: Christ is the foundation of the faith that preached by the apostles and kept by the fathers. Again, Christ is the foundation of the faith that's preached by the apostles and kept by the fathers. So church fathers are continuation. Please beware when somebody says, it's St. Paul who said this, not Christ. <laughs> These statements are, and this is how we, we allow things to come, for example, homosexuality and, and stuff like this. It's, it's, it's St. Paul who said it, or Paul who said it. It's not Christ who said it. Might be his opinion, might be based on the circumstances, based on the on the on the on the life they are, you know, the, 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 the time they are living in. Of course, completely bogus. There's no difference between the apostles and Christ. The apostles are preaching Christ, no one else. So whatever the apostle says is as if Christ said it. He said it in Luke chapter 20. I don't know how people dissect the Bible like this. The one who listens to me is listening to, to you, is listening to me. The one who refuses you is refusing me. And the one who refuses me because he attends it to the Father, refuses the Father as well. So I don't know where do we get that Paul said it and not Christ. This is completely heretical. If anybody says this, then the understanding of the Bible is, I can dare to say it's really heretical because there is no difference at all between the apostles and Christ. He intended that he ascends, that they preach him. If he wanted to correct their preaching, he would have stayed. But he was so sure, he was so sure of how they will protect the church. That's why he ascended and told them, do not leave till you receive the power from the highest. And before in John 14 I will, and 16, I will send you another comforter. So don't say one word. Once the Pentecost happened, if you hear what the apostles are saying and doing, this is exactly what God intended them to do. There is no difference between the apostles and Christ. So the faith is Christ, delivered to us by the apostles, kept by the fathers. This is the, the creed of what the apostolic church definition is. Okay, let's continue. And they are marveled, for Paul also calls them a jewel, surely on account of their stability and consistency, sustaining and supporting the common body of the church. Moreover, with their enlightened lives and their saving doctrine. Exactly. So, how are the apostles consistent? Because you go any church and it has communion, it has the sacraments of the church. That is the epitome of consistency. There is no personal introduction of an opinion. But rather, that's why the church remained intact and answered all the heresies because it, it, it is run anywhere you go. It is the same type of service and worship um, and practice of having Christ inside the church by the, by the sacraments of the church. So it's not rules of the church. This is, this is exactly appears here that the, the sustaining and supporting sustaining and supporting the common body of the church, moreover, with their enlightened lives, the, right, the lifestyle of the apostles, and their saving doctrine. That wherever they went, they established a church, that's now you go anywhere, it's the same church, in terms of apostolic, uh, as an apostolic church. Theodore of Seir, of Sire, his form. His form is like choice incense, like Peter. Here again, she makes reference to the fact of two natures. 
calling the divine nature incense, since by the law incense was offered to God, and by Peter referring to the human nature, it is in its not being affected by the rottenness of sin, the cedar tree not going on. Okay, uh, please underline this because this was a huge heresy that was answered in 431 in the Council of Ephesus. The heresy was by Nestorius, the, two, the, 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 the divine and the human nature and how in Christ these natures are united without mingling, without confusion, without alteration. And after the uniting, we no longer call him having two natures. He has one compound nature. We call it God in the flesh. God in the flesh. Divine and human. The one nature, one nature, one mea thesis. One compound nature of God, the Logos. Of the incarnate God, the Logos. Incarnate means the, the human and the Logos means the divine. But once the unity happened, we don't separate them. We don't talk about them as two. Mia, not, 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 not diophesis. And not monophysis because we're considered to the ignorant as monophysite. So it's called to be heretical. We are meophysite that we have, which is what Ephesus 431 major major council. So I will mention this in the in the, in the liturgy without without which we would be completely um, on a completely different plane. Okay, I'll finish top my beloved and my friend. His mouth, his mouth is sweet, is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend or daughters of Jerusalem. So just to come and Theodore of Sire, just to tell you how the fathers comment on the Bible, they introduce the teaching. That's why we cannot say, uh, we cannot say this is like we need spiritual, 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 just fluff all the time. That won't work. Even his, as we comment on the Bible, how is the Bible linked to the faith that Christ intended to be revealed by the Bible is that he, he, he opens the mind of the church, not a single father. They all agree on this. And they teach us how the divinity of Christ and, and, and is, is defended. Otherwise, our salvation is questionable because we don't know how we're saved then. It's God who took flesh. Once he took flesh, they're not mingling together. They're not separated from one another. He ascends with this flesh. He keeps it holy. But in the meantime, this flesh does not affect the divinity, and the divinity does not affect the human. That is our faith. That is our faith. And it had to be defended because one patriarch, Nestorius, invented something that separated these into two. So the church had to jump in, church fathers, and says, no, this is wrong. <clears throat> St. Ambrose, such is the concern of the soul that's pure. Such is what it perceives within. It discerns God and abounds in all good things. On this account, his mouth is sweet and he is all delight. So that answers any question that there is fun in Christianity. That's a discomfort here. <laughs> but uh, the fun that of the Christian is it brings peace always because he knows what to do, things that doesn't damage his soul. So he always, he can go somewhere to a movie, he can go out to eat, he can do good all of the fun that, that needs to be done. But then when he comes to the church, he doesn't feel he's away from God. He hears it and says that this is the same language that I like to hear every time. Once we find this language strange, then I started to become more asleep than awake. For God is the author of all good things and all things which are, are his. The end of Seville, so long as Christ wishes there to be one church of all nations, Whoever is a stranger to the church is not considered a part of the body of Christ, even though he uses the name of Christian. Again, he is indeed your true bridegroom. He is also your brother. He is likewise your friend. He is your inheritance. He is your reward. He is God and the Lord. You have in him bridegroom to love, for he is fair in beauty above the sons of men. He writes this by the way to nuns. So that's why you find the language of like to the, to the nuns, they always call them the brides of Christ. As we say to St. Verena, which means that the bride, the bride of Christ. <clears throat> and the grace of God the Father be with us all. Amen. Enjoy the Lent, enjoy the Holy Week, and be ready for it. Amen.